good evening to all the ladies and gentlemen and uh, before i start my presentation i would like to thank professor dr anura mana tunga and the entire team of the department of archaeology sri lanka for providing me this opportunity to connect with all of you and to uh, give this presentation and to introduce my country my heritage to all of you so i would be starting my presentation which is obviously you people know that it's about the gandhara uh, civilization which is pakistan's glorious buddhist heritage and we are very proud of it so uh, dr mana uh, anura mana tunga has already introduced me very well and i'm very happy that uh, i had been a part of that conference which he was speaking about in 2015 i guess and uh, i am really i was really inspired by the hospitality that the sri lankans provided us and particularly the friend our friend our family friend i can say now uh, professor mana tunga and i really see uh, and look forward for any other conference that you will be providing us to join and i will be very glad to be the part of it again so uh, first i will be introducing pakistan and its heritage and i hope most of you know that pakistan is one of the few countries of the world having the richest cultural heritage and our history is traced back to the stone age and the uh, with evolution processes going through various eras of history reaching the colonial period of british raj of 19th century uh in pakistan as uh, dr uh, mana tunga already introduced that in pakistan we have two most significant sites of indus valley civilization that is harappa and mohenjodaro that date back to around 2500 bce then pakistan is a very proud custodian of the gandhara civilization which is known for its buddhist uh, art and architecture and that would be the topic of today the country also owns some very sacred sites of uh, hinduism like uh, katas raj and hanglaj temple sites then we also have some six sacred sites of gurdwara panja sahab and kartarpur they are also in pakistan besides these we are also having a number of historical forts shrines mosques gardens that are part of pakistan's proud heritage so northwestern region uh, let's come to the topic northwestern region has been the center of cultural heritage throughout the ages and extensive gandharan buddhist cultural heritage is scattered all over the region which indicates its former glory so uh, i would be now uh giving you a brief detail of gandhara about the meaning what actually is meant by gandhara and where, where it appeared for the first time in the literary text and in the archaeological sources so the name gandhara um it, it had several meanings but the most prominent meaning of gandhara is the land of fragrance if we break the word gand it means fragrance and hara means the land so it becomes the land of fragrance its first mention comes from the holy um, vedic literature that is rigveda where it is mentioned as the region provide uh, known for its best wool then uh, when we speak about the archaeological sources the the, uh, the name gandhara it is mentioned in the persian inscriptions from the achaemenid dynasty uh, it uh, the first inscription of the achaemenid dynasty the behistun inscription mentions is it uh, as the uh, one of the region which was inherited by darius when he occupied the throne it is also mentioned in the persepolis palace inscription of darius where he mentions that it was the region from where he imported the wood for building his palace so the region has a very uh, long history and it as as i mentioned that it has been mentioned in the earliest literary and uh, archaeological sources of this region so my presentation would um, depend uh, would be uh, on the following topics that i would be um, briefly describing the geography or the extent of ancient gandhara region with the help of a map 
then I will be telling you about the few cultural centers of ancient Gandhara and a brief history of ancient Gandhara is also a subtopic. Then what were the main objectives of this Gandhara art um, will also be discussed. The material of production of Gandhara art, the subject matter, and then very interesting, the scenes from the life story of Buddha. I have few panels that I would be sharing with you. The foreign influences on the art are also included. And then I will be um, uh, also uh, telling about the uh, traveling of Gandhara abroad beyond the borders of South Asia. And then I have few, I had visited the site of Texila where I um, um, uh, met some artisans who are still keeping alive this art tradition. So I will be showing you the modern sculptures that are being um, made by the modern artisans of uh, this region, of the region of Texila. So uh, with this, I will be starting from the geography that is the extent of ancient Gandhara. Um, th this region is, as I mentioned, that it is a historic region of Northwest Pakistan, and it has some sites in Afghanistan as well. So it has a very broad extent. The boundaries of Gandhara, they varied throughout history. That it means that some of the regions, they were included within Gandhara in, uh, in, during sometimes and in the other times they were not included in the boundary of Gandhara. So uh, sometimes Peshawar Valley and Texila were collectively referred as Gandhara. Sometimes Sawat was also included. So in this way, we say that there was one proper Gandhara which, which actually had the boundaries of Gandhara and there was one cultural Gandhara, which means that the that was the a region which was producing the art that was beyond the actual borders of Gandhara, which uh, comprised of the Upper Punjab region, the whole Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and the Eastern Afghanistan. So that was the extent of ancient Gandhara region. And uh, you would have observed that it was a very vast region. And it had various workshops in uh, which uh, the, the Buddhist art of Gandhara was being produced. And the workshops were having the, their dif different or distinct uh, style. And the material that was being used was also of a distinct kind that would be discussed in my further um, slides. Uh, then uh, this is the map which, uh, which in which you can see uh, the um, stupa monastery complexes all around, which are spread all around the Gandhara region. And uh, the, um, the famous ones are from uh, uh, Peshawar, Shaji Ki Dheri, Sehre Behlol, Bala Hesar. Um, Jamal Gadi, Gambart, Nemogram, um, Gumbatuna, they are all in Sabat and from Charsada. So this is the map which actually uh, can give you an idea for, of the extent of the cultural Gandhara. And if you see on the uh, west, it is uh, beyond the borders actually and from here you can see the Bimana and Ahin Posh and also Bamiyan. Uh, which is not uh, mentioned here. Then Texila, Bhamala in the eastern side, Manikyala near the Rawalpindi. So uh, this was the map of ancient Gandhara, which uh, shows the geography of this uh, ancient, very important region of South Asia. Uh, then uh, the cultural centers of ancient Gandhara, as I mentioned in uh, previously that Proper Gandhara was a bit smaller and the cultural Gandhara was a bit, uh, was beyond the borders of the actual Gandhara or the Gandhara proper. So uh, it had numerous cultural centers, which were also mentioned in the previous slide in, in the map I showed. And, uh, but the most important among them are uh, the Pushkalavati, that is the Lotus City, which is modern, which is called as Char Sada in modern times and it is near Peshawar. Then um, there is a very famous cultural center, which is Purushapura, which is um, the modern city of Peshawar. It, it, it produced a very um, uh, inspiring um, Buddha sculptures and uh, uh, Buddhist panels. Uh, uh, they are from this um, 
uh, city, a cultural center. Then we have Takshashila, which is called as Texila in modern times, and it is in the Rawalpindi districts. And then Udabhandapura, which is called as Hand, and it is near Atak in the upper Punjab region. And uh, besides that, Besides these, we also have some very important uh, workshops or cultural centers in uh, Jamal Gari, in Sawat. Sawat had been a very important center for the production of Gandhara art. It had a very different style. The facial features of Buddha and the other characters of Gandhara art are completely different from those um, that were produced in the other workshops of Gandhara. We have uh, Hadda, we have um, uh, Nemogram, we have the other other sites that they were very important um, works that they had been very important workshops for the production of Gandhara art. So um, uh, Dharma Rajika Stupa, this is uh, present in Texila city, modern Texila city and the history of it goes back to the Ashokan period. Ashoka um, Raja, who uh, was the third Mauryan king, he, during his uh, Buddhist propagation campaign, the ar architectural campaign, he built this stupa in Texila. And it is said that uh, the relics of the of Buddha uh, were contained uh, inside the stupa. But uh, unfortunately, the treasure hunters, they uh, damaged the core of the stupa and uh, some of the relics they were stolen. It's a very pleasant site um, and uh, a very vast site present in, in Texila and probably the earliest site, Buddha site of Texila dating back to Ashokan period. Then we have Julia. Julia is again in Texila and the importance of Julia is that this site uh, according to Dr. Ahmed Hassandani, who is the famous uh, South Asian archaeologist known for uh, his work in paleography and uh, archaeology, he um, mentioned that Julia was probably the, si the site which was um, known for its uh, uh, academic activities. So probably the ancient Takshashila University or the university that was present, Buddhist university that was present in Texila was having its, were centered, the activities of uh, the university were centered here in Julia. It was uh, mentioned by him that uh, due to the um, discovery of few um, ink pots from the sites, it can be said that it had some academic activities going on here. So probably the Buddhist University of Tak Takshashila was uh, prevalent here, was going, was doing activities here. But still, it cannot be uh, said with some. Uh, with, with, with it's just an assumption on the basis of the discovery of ink pot, uh, ink pots. Uh, but still, we have some uh, references that Takshashila University was there and it had been working since the um, uh, 66th century and it was earlier earlier uh, to the Buddhist period. It, was, it had been a Hindu university known for the um, imparting of Vedic um, literature and for uh, uh, different other skills and uh, the famous philosopher Chanakya was also one of the professors of this university. But uh, uh, in the Buddhist times, this site is marked as the uh, University of Takshashila. Then we have takht bahi which is a very important site for the site for the Buddhists. This is in Mardan, and um, uh, it had a very long history. Um, uh, it, the history goes back to third century CE from ninth from approximately to eighth century CE. And we also have traces of Vajrayana Buddhism from the upper strata, stratums, uh, strata of this uh, uh, site. So uh, the Bahi means the, uh, the throne of springs. And you can see that it, it is a breathtaking site. The view is very important and it is found on, on top of a hill uh, near Mardan. Then we have Butkara Stupa. This is in Sawat. Uh, the ancient Udyana, and it is said that Butkara Stupa was uh, built during the period of Ashoka, and it is again a very 
um, old or uh, one of the earliest stupas of this region. We have uh, in Takshashila, in uh, modern Takshila, there were three cities that were excavated. The first one was Bhirmaund, the second one was Sirkep, and the third one was um, uh, Sirsuk. So this uh, picture is from the from Sir, Sirkep, and this shows the shrine of the double-headed eagle, which uh, shows uh, various influences. Uh, this one building from the city of Sir, Sir Kep, which, which is the second fortified city of Texela, it um, gives us the idea that so many influences were at work. We can see the presence of a double-headed eagle here, which shows the Babylonian influence, the doorways of the Indian tradition, the um, Greek style of doorway. So the entire um, monument is uh, a complex, a blend of different influences. So uh, let's have a brief look on the history of ancient Gandhara. As I mentioned earlier, that this city had a uh, very long history and it dates back to 6th century BC. I, I'm not actually including the prehistoric period, just switching to the historic period, which date back to 6th century BC when it was a part of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. And it is said that this uh, region, Gandhara region, was the 21st satrapy or the 21st province of the per Persian Empire. And they had a very well hold of this region. Later on, it was conquered by Alexander in 327 to 326 BC. Then after the departure of Alexander and his uh, um, Greek forces, it was acquired by the Mauryans in third century BC by Chandragupta Maurya. Then his grandson Ashoka Maurya erected the monuments to denote his rule throughout the Gandhara region, particularly in Shahbazgari, Mansera, and Texela. Shahbazgari and Mansehra, they are the two regions that, that are known for the um, uh, presence of rock inscriptions of uh, the uh, Ashoka Maurya. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the inscriptions, they tell us about the Dhamma that had been promulgated by Ashoka during his reign. Then after the death of Ashoka in 232 BC, the conditions became favorable for foreign aggression, and then the region became a prey to many foreign invasions. Then the region was then controlled by the Indo-Greeks, then by the Indo-Scythians, by the Indo-Parthians successively. Then in first century CE, Gandhara was conquered by the Kushans, who had come from northwestern China. Kanishka, the fourth Kushan ruler, made Peshawar or ancient Purushapura his capital, and Gandhara then became a cultural center. And this is the time when Gandhara art rose into prominence. Prior to that, the art already existed in this region. It was supported by many of the dynasties, but it was an, uh, an iconic Buddhist art. That is, Buddha was never portrayed in human form. But from this period onwards, that is from first century CE or from or after the fourth Buddhist council, which was presided by um, uh, Ashwaghosha and Vasumitra um, uh, under the patronage of Kanishka, the Gandhara art was, uh, it became an iconic art. And uh, as I will be mentioning in my further slide that uh, the art was known for the first anthropomorphic depiction of Buddha for the first time. Then we have, uh, uh, after that, we hear about, and we have some sources, archeological sources that the White Huns, when they visited this region and they controlled this region in the late fifth century, they, it gave a severe blow to the cultural and religious activities in ancient Gandhara. Uh, basically these White Huns, they destroyed all the cultural um, uh, remnants that they came uh, across and um, uh, Gandhara, the, uh, the art, the architecture was badly damaged. Then the Muslim invasion in the 11th century swept the last traces of Buddhism and also Gandhara art in the region. And then it could never recover its glorious tradition and thus its existence vanished from the face of the earth. 
Okay, so uh, Gandhara, uh, I will be now uh, briefing you the, about Gandhara art, that what is uh, actually the Gandhara art. First of all, it is a Buddhist art, and it is called as Gandhara art because it is it developed in the ancient Gandhara region. Al although uh, prior to the name Gandhara art, it was given uh, the name of Romano-Buddhist art, Greco-Buddhist art, and various other names were also given to this art. But later on, it was decided that the same art which was found from the boundaries of Gandhara region, it would be it should be named as. Gandhara art. So that is why it is named so. So uh, the dates from uh, uh, which we get this art is from 1st century BC to 6th century CE. And it was mainly devoted to the propagation and promotion of Buddhism. It is based on the Tiriratan or the three jewels of Buddhism, which, uh, which are the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha or the Buddhist community. Uh, then objectives, uh, what were the objectives of this Gandhara art? The main objective of Gandhara art was Buddhism. It was the principal factor in the development of Gandhara art, which gave themes and point to this art and its imposing traditions, which had come from Magadh, which was the first holy land of Buddhism, as Gandhara is also is called as the second holy land of Buddhism. Magadh was the first. So the traditions which had been coming from Magadh were all, all uh, being applied here and they were being used to promote this art. Then it was devoted to serve the Buddhist faith by focusing on the life of Buddha. We will be seeing that how the life story of Buddha was narrated in this art beautifully. Um, we do have some influence, foreign influences, we, but uh, on, on the same hand, we also have the local or the indigenous influences on the art as well. Besides the Buddhist deities, numerous non-Buddhist deities were also depicted in Gandhara art, but they were depicted in a less significant manner. In, in most of the panels, Buddha is shown uh, in a larger, he is shown in, as a big character, but the others are shown smaller. So um, uh, I will be... Uh, showing you that. Then the material of production, there are various materials that were used for the production of this art. But initially, stone was the main medium of production. The sto stones of different colors were being used, like uh, the stone was mica schist, Black, gray, and blue shades of mica schist were being used. Then we have green phyllite. Green phyllite was basically from the Udyana or from the Savat region. So we can identify quickly when we see the green uh, green shade of uh, panels. We just we quickly say that they come from the Savat or Udyana workshop. So every workshop has its di distinct color, and on the basis of the color of stone, they can be identified. In the later years, when the production was, uh, the, the demand was much more, we see that the small, uh, softer medium that is stucco and lime plaster was also being used. And later on, it, it replaced the shift. Later on, the, uh, the stucco and lime plaster replaced uh, the stone and because the demand was much more then terracotta was also added terracotta many of the heads were um, uh, being uh, um, made with the help of terracotta and Texila workshop is mostly known for the production of terracotta head sculptures and there is an abundance then we also have some sculptures from uh, the, which are in gold silver copper bronze and iron we do we also come across certain stone sculptures that show the inlay of semi-precious stones like amethyst, carnelian, lapis lazuli, etc. Inlay in the sense that in at the place of Urna, some semi-precious stones were uh, put here to make it more beautiful. So these were the material of production in which Gandhara art was being produced. Then the subject matter of Gandhara art. Gandhara art is, as I mentioned, that it is connected with the origin of Buddha image. Uh, it is claimed that Buddha image was for the first time produced here. 
the remarkable developments of Buddhist iconography. Uh, I will be showing you Gandhara school is usually recognized with the first depiction of Buddha in the, in the human form, independent images, either seated or standing, and the numerous representations from the scene of from the life of Buddha and also the Jatka stories were uh, almost nine Jatka stories they are depicted in Gandhara. Buddha is shown in many different poses, uh, Abhaya Mudra, Dhyana Mudra, Dharma Chakra Mudra, Bhumi Spasa Mudra, few portray uh, Bodhisattvas, many sculptures, as I mentioned, that they, um, they were carved in the shape of small panels and they were fixed against the wall of the stupas and some of the, them, uh, those panels were um, larger uh, in size and they were uh, installed in front of the corridors in the monasteries. So um, Buddha's life story is depicted and his previous birth stories, that is Jatka stories, nine of them are depicted in uh, Gandhara art. So I will be now uh, switching to the most important and the most interesting part of my presentation, which is uh, the few episodes from the life story of Buddha. So in Gandhara, uh, as you can see the screen, that uh, the uh, uh, narration of Buddha's story is extremely beautiful and inspirational. This panel, it shows the dream of Queen Maya, and uh, uh, which shows that a white elephant um, in the traditions, Buddhist tradition, it is mentioned that it was probably six tusk elephant which entered the body of Queen Maya, which is beautifully depicted here that the queen is lying on the couch sleeping and dreaming about the um, uh, white elephant which is entering in her body. Then the uh, next panel is about the interpretation of Queen Maya's dream where King Sadodhana, uh, the father of Siddharth and Queen Maya, they, have, uh, they had called the soothsayer or the fortune teller to uh, interpret the dream of Queen Maya upon which uh, he told that Queen Maya has conceived and she will soon be giving birth to uh, a very um, auspicious son. Then uh, a panel which is now in um, British Museum, preserved in the British Museum, a very beautiful panel as you can see. It shows the birth of Siddharth and uh, the presence of different gods uh, is also depicted and the baby Siddharth is also here. Uh, and it is the scene is behind the plot. There are numerous panels in Gandhara art which show uh, the birth of the, the nativity scene, the birth of Siddharth, but I included this, that this is the personal favorite of mine. And uh, um, so the birth of Siddharth is shown here. Another um, panel which also shows the birth and another episode which is the seven steps of the child Siddharth. Uh, Queen Maya is shown holding the sal tree uh, in the Lumbini groove and uh, the gods are there. Her sister Mahaprajapati is there and the, the child is coming from the right side. And we also see that the child is standing here and the scene is um, represent, it represents the seven steps of the child, which, which uh, shows that after the birth, the child took seven steps in east, west, north, and south. So um, among the different, uh, the various miracles of Siddharth, this was also the one which was soon after uh, his birth. Then we have the first bath and we can see that the two gods, Indra and God Brahma, they are giving bath to baby Siddharth. This panel is now preserved in the Peshawar Museum. Uh, this is uh, a panel which shows the, um, the prediction of uh, future by um, uh, the ascetic, by the fortune teller who was uh, here in the palace to predict the future of baby Siddharth who is lying in the lap of this uh, soothsayer. And he here mentioned that this child is going either going to become a universal teacher or become a universal monarch. So obviously, Sadodna wanted him to uh, become a universal monarch as compared to because nobody likes to become a teacher. So he confined him into the palace. This very beautiful panel um, probably in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, US, 
This shows the scene of uh, Siddharth going to school on RAM. Uh, so this is Siddharth, who is accompanied by his companions and friends and the school colleagues going to school. There is another um, defaced um, a panel which shows the presence of Siddharth in school. Siddharth is um, probably in front of his teacher learning something, learning to write uh, or something. Then we have, um, uh, as uh, I mentioned that uh, Sadodna, the father of Siddharth, wanted to, to him to become um, a universal monarch, a universal ruler, so he can find him to the palace life and he provided all the earthly pressures to his son within the palace. And he was uh, made to learn all the princely skills uh, which um, a, a, a prince had to um, expert expertise. So this is a scene which uh, tells us that uh, uh, Siddharth was learning archery. It's a bit defaced, but this is the archery scene. Then we have a wrestling scene. Uh, the picture is not very good, but it shows that Siddharth also learned uh, wrestling. Then we have uh, the scene of marriage of Yashod with uh, his marriage with Yashodra. Uh, in the Buddhist traditions, it is mentioned that uh, when Siddharth was born, three other um, uh, living beings were also born. One was uh, Yashodra, the other was Channar Chandak, and one was his horse Kanthak. So at the age of 16, when um, when they both attained Yashodra and Siddharth, they attained the age of 16, they were married. She was also a princess of the nearby state and they were married to each other. They, this scene shows the marriage scene and uh, they are moving around the fire here. Then uh, it is uh, the Siddharth's first meditation because here you can see that it is uh, this, uh, uh, he is shown as a bodhisattva, uh, bodhisattva Siddharth, wearing all the jewelry and uh, the princely robes and meditating. So, so before departure, before the renunciation, he was also meditating in the palace and uh, he was not very much. Uh, um, inspired by the um, uh, palace life, the royal life. So he was uh, in search of truth and in search of uh, enlightenment. And he was also meditating before the renunciation. So that is, this is mentioned in this panel. Then the life of palace is here, where the king and uh, the, the uh, Siddharth and Yashodra are sitting on the couch and they are having drummers and the dancers. They are pleasing them. They are entertaining both of them and they are enjoying the life at full. Then we have uh, the life in the palace before renunciation. The scene shows that everyone, everyone is sleeping. Only Siddharth is planning to leave the palace uh, while everyone is um, uh, fall um, uh, asleep. So this palace, uh, this uh, um, panel shows the uh, life of the palace before uh, renunciation. Then the, the scene, very beautiful one, it shows the great departure scene. And you can see that uh, Prince Siddharth is leaving the palace on his horse, Kanthat. And the horse is being carried by the gods just to uh, ensure that there is no sound and nobody awakes when they go out. So this was a kind of uh, a very um, um, silent escape from the palace. And uh, the panel beautifully depicts uh, the scene. Then uh, there were many, uh, uh, when, when he left the palace, he cut off his hair, he threw his uh, princely robes and he met certain ascetics in the woods. And th those uh, ascetics, they did not satisfy him because he was in search of uh, the uh, uh, enlightenment and he was in search of the truth, uh, the actual truth of the life. So he thought too fast, and he he uh, when he started fasting, he the pro in the process of starving and self mortification, he became so skinny and so weak that he realized that um, uh, he cannot get enlightenment by uh, the process of self mortification. So he then abandoned the um, uh, the fasting. This panel is a, a, this uh, this sculpture is very important in the sen that sense that this is the masterpiece of Gandhara art. As you can see, that this um, 
sculpture shows the whole anatomy of the human body. This uh, sculpture lies in the Lahore Museum of Pakistan and considered as the masterpiece of Gandhara art. Then uh, uh, this scene shows the offering of food by uh, the village girl who offered the, the rice, a, a bowl of rice and milk before he sat for uh, meditation at Gaya. Then uh, we see that when during his meditation under the peepal tree, uh, he was disturbed and distorted by the evil forces of Mara. We can see that the demons are here who are trying to distort and frighten him. And there, there, there is another panel which shows the daughters of Mara as well, which I have not included in present, my presentation, but there are many um, such panels which show this event of Buddha. And here he is in Bhumi Sparsa Mudra, touching the earth to witness that he is still under uh, in meditation, although he has been disturbed, distracted by the evil forces of Mara. Then after that, when he attained enlightenment, he was offered uh, the um, uh, four bowls from the four loka palas or the um, custodians of the four quarters of earth. And he chose the bowl of stone rather than of the uh, precious metals. So this is a very beautiful panel again, which shows the offering of four bowls. Then when he uh, be became enlightened, uh, the gods, they insisted Siddharth to preach what he had attained from enlightenment. So this, this panel shows that he is about to preach and he is shown in Abhaya Mudra, that is his right hand is raised and he is now planning to uh, promote and to impart his uh, knowledge, his uh, enlightenment and nirvana to how he attained it and what are the keys to attain nirvana. So this panel shows the first ceremony at Sarnath in which he set the law of uh, um, uh, dharma, the law of uh, the wheel of law in motion. And in, in this he uh, is shown with his first disciples and Vajrapani who is standing behind him and two deer um, uh, at the base which symbolizes the deer park at Sarnath where the first ceremony took place and from this time onwards the Buddha, Buddhism had commenced and it uh, was started because he turned the law of uh, the wheel of law in motion. Then uh, we have the miracle of Sravasti. It is said that in Raj Graha, so a few um, uh, people, they asked him to show his miracles uh, in front of K King Prasanajit. So what he did was that he lifted his body in air and he um, showered uh, his uh, feet. Uh, the water was showering from his feet and flames were coming out of his shoulders and he divided himself into multiple images of him. So it has many um, uh, episodes, this miracle of Sravasti. This panel is one of the panels of the miracle, depicting the miracle of Sravasti. Then we have the Mahapari Nirvana or the death scene in which the Buddha is shown lying on the couch and the people around him are mourning. Even the Vajrapani can be seen mourning. Uh, besides the couch of Buddha. Uh, after uh, the, the, uh, Mahapari, the attainment of Mahapari Nirvana, we see that he was cremated uh, according to the Hindu traditions. He was his body was cremated. And this panel shows the cremation scene. Uh, also the Mahapari Nirvana scene here and uh, the cremation scene. Then uh, after that, the relics, the ashes of Buddha, they were shared with uh, the rajas who attended the cremation and the uh, last um, event, last ceremony of uh, uh, Buddha. So this uh, panel uh, depicts the sharing of Buddha's relics. Then the building of stupa, stupa because the relics they were placed, um, uh, uh, they were buried in stupa and uh, the building of a stupa was built over it. So this shows the building of stupa and also the veneration of stupa is uh, symbolized here. That after the death, people they started venerating the Tiriratan and the stupa 
uh, because they were actually uh, trying to uh, give uh, pay homage to um, Buddha. So this panel shows the worship of Tiriratan, as I mentioned, the Tiriratan are the three jewels of Buddhism, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that is the Buddhist community. Then uh, there are few individual sculptures also in, there are numerous sculptures, I have included few. In this uh, sculpture, Buddha is shown in Abhaya Mudra, with his right hand raised in reassurance posture. Then uh, the Buddha in teaching posture, which is uh, which shows uh, Dharma Chakra Mudra, the teaching posture in, in which uh, the eyes are semi-closed, accompanied by Bodhisattvas, and uh, uh, shows that he is sitting on the lotus throne and teaching, imparting his knowledge. And then uh, in Dhyana Mudra, that is in meditation, eyes are closed and the hands are lying in his lap. Then we have uh, Bhumi's Parsa Mudra. I have already shown one panel uh, of attack of Mara. This panel also shows the attack of Mara when he was in meditation for uh, 49 days. He, uh, he uh, was calling the earth. Bhumi's Parsa Mudra is the, the calling of earth to witness. He, with his index finger touching the um, earth to and calling the earth to witness that he sat unmoved and undistorted, although he had been uh, disturbed by the forces of evil Mara. Then Bodhisattva, there are many Bodhisattvas who are portrayed. They are portrayed like uh, the prince. They are, they are found in heavy jewelry, very elaborate headdress. Uh, you can see every kind of jewelry on their body. This is a Maitriya lying in the National Museum. Uh, of Pakistan in Karachi, and it is a very beautiful piece. Uh, you can see the uh, jewelry that he's uh, wearing, an elaborate hairstyle. And here, the hollow is there. The, uh, he once, uh, and he's, uh, there was a semi precious stone that was uh, inlaid here. Uh, then, uh, uh, Besides all uh, different um, uh, Buddha stories and uh, Bodhisattvas and all that, there are few more characters that are portrayed in Gandhara art, like Hariti and Panchika, who, is, who was thought to be a demon, and she was known for eating the kids of uh, uh, the region where she used to live. But after uh, she was converted by Buddha and she became the goddess. So her, she is portrayed with um, a few children, a few kids of her with her husband Panchika as well. So there are numerous other sculptures which portray him, portray her very beautifully, and they are found from every workshop of uh, Gandhara. Uh, then um, I would be now to, uh, switching to the foreign influences over Gandhara art. As I already mentioned, that this art is very beautiful, um, more because it is a mixture of classical Roman and Greek styles, Persian and Indian skills were also at work uh, while it was being made. Uh, this heterogeneous style was the result of a long history of the region. As I mentioned that it, it, it had been controlled, this region had been controlled by the Persian Achaemenid dynasty, then by the Greeks under uh, the uh, leadership of uh, Alexander, then the Indo-Greeks, then the Indo-Scythians, then the Indo Parthians and then the Kushans. So uh, all of them had inspired this, uh, they had put the influences in this art because the artists were there and all the, all the uh, influences were um, uh, accepted by the art of this region. It was initially termed as Greek or Buddhist, Greek or Roman, Romano Buddhist, and Bactro Gandharan by different scholars, but finally it was given the name Gandhara art. Uh, Greek and Roman influences, they can be traced in Gandhara art through architectural and ornamental details. So uh, as you can see that most of the panels, they are enframed with the presence of Corinthian pilasters here. So when the, when the scene ends, there is always a Corinthian pilaster which, which acts as a full stop. So um, this uh, depicts the Greek influence. And uh, as uh, all of us know that Corinthian style of Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian styles, they are the Greek styles of uh, um, um, uh, architecture. Then the depiction of uh, Atlas, 
uh, it is also um, it also uh, shows the Greek influence. Then the depiction of cupids. Numerous depictions are there. They are also called as Amorini. They are the garland bearers. They are also called as garland bearers, and they they are called as cupids as well. So there is a abundant depiction of them. Then we have uh, the scenes of drinking and celebration, and you can see that the characters of the scene they they don't look indigenous, they don't don't look in Indian. The costumes they are of the Roman origin. You can see they are um, wearing himation and all that. So this scene it it is not an indigenous scene. It purely gives the idea of a Roman style, which influenced uh, Gandhara. Then uh, the depiction of Hercules obviously uh, shows the um, uh, Roman uh, in, uh, influence. Then the ornaments, uh, special Roman dress, and uh, including the sandals that that was worn by Bodhisattva figures. Most of the characters of Gandhara they are depicted barefooted because that was the trend of the time. But we see that a uh, few foreigners are shown wearing shoes. And the book, some of the bodhisattvas, they are shown wearing these Roman style of sandals, which obviously show the Roman influence over the art of Gandhara. Then Buddha in human form itself is a Greek, uh, is a result of a Greek uh, influence because they used to depict their gods in human form. So prior to that, we don't have any instance here in South Asia that the gods were being represented in human form. So, so the uh, connection of this culture with the uh, Greeks, they brought the idea that the gods should be represented in uh, the human form and the result was the depiction of Buddha in anthropomorphic form. Then uh, my last part, the last part of my presentation is that uh, Gandhara, uh, as I mentioned, that it started from first century BC, roughly first it was uh, an, an, an iconic art. And then with the passage of time, the, it became the iconic art that is Buddha was portrayed in human form. So uh, it lasted up to 6th century CE. Uh, then it uh, crossed the borders of India and reached the uh, reach other parts of uh, the world like China, Japan and Korea and hence it became the parent art of uh, China, Japan and Korea. So uh, in China, uh, uh, this uh, picture was taken when uh, I was there in China for my postdoc. And uh, this is from Yungong Grottoes in Datong. And you can see that uh, the features are, oh, so we can say they are a bit sinicized, but still they uh, give the influence of uh, Gandhara art over them. There are numerous, but I have just included few of them. Then the Meiji Shan Tian in Tian Shui, China. We, you can see the treatment of robes that was almost uh, copied from the art of Gandhara. <clears throat> then in Longman Luoyong, uh, again the treatment of robes. Uh, but in, in, in initial form, we see that the Buddhist art of Gandhara was inspired, Buddhist art of China was inspired from Gandhara, but later on, uh, from uh, the 6th century onwards, it became independent of Gandhara influences. So some of these sculptures of China, they are very much, they seem very much inspired, inspirational from the art of Gandhara. Uh, then uh, my last part is the connection, connectivity, the continuity of the artistic traditions in modern time. When I was, uh, as I mentioned that I was uh, in Texela, uh, probably in 2019, at that time I met few artisans who were busy in copying the actual Gandhara sculptures. So the tradition is still in continuity. The artists are making the sculptures, although they are not uh, very uh, good, like those who uh, that were be, that were being produced in the actual times. But still, the artisans, the art is running in their blood, and they are engaged in this in this craft. And uh, uh, they have also they when I interviewed them, they said that they are displaying this art in national and international exhibitions also. So this is one of the panel from the modern artisans. Uh, which shows the uh, 
uh, life before the renunciation, life of palace before renunciation. And this is also uh, Hariti, probably Hariti is shown uh, in this panel with a cornucopia. And these are the individual panels uh, with Hariti, meditating Buddha and a Buddha and also the fasting Buddha and meditating Buddha. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, Gandhara art originated and developed in ancient Gandhara region, flourished from first century to sixth century CE, came up with an objective to disseminate the Buddhist faith, credited for the first representation of Buddha in human form. It is an indigenous art destined to serve a religion of Indian origin with foreign influences. And uh, it is considered as the parent art of China, Japan, and Korean art. Study of Gandhara sculptures helped to reconstruct the social and economic conditions of the period. The blend of Western style with local techniques attributes for its exclusiveness. The art attracts admirers from all over the world, uh, admirers from all over the world since the time of its discovery. Thank you for uh, being there and for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much.